So I'm going live now. Perfect. Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online in association with Uttaranchal Orthopedic Association. To introduce today's topic and speaker, I hand over to Dr. A.K. Sirohi. Thank you, Dr. Bijlani. <clears throat> welcome to the 14th webinar of Uttaranchal Orthopedic Association. We are having a weekly webinars this year during the COVID times and this is the 14th one. I am extremely thankful to our speakers today, Dr. Professor Mandeep Dhillan and Professor Naresh Agrawal sir. Today we will be taking the subject of and there will be three talks. We can't hear Dr. Sirohi. Yes, we can't. His video is frozen. That means he went away. Uh, network guy on the side. Use only yeah, his uh, yeah. he sound and not the video. Yeah, he's coming back. Okay. We lost the connection. Sorry. Now. Am I audible now? Yes. Yes. We have our panelist, Dr. K. S. Anand, who is present secretary of Indian Foot and Ankle Society. Welcome you. Thank you, sir. We will be having though I, Dr. Mandeep Dillon needs no introduction, but as it is a customary, I would be reading his short introduction for the benefit of those who may be not uh, knowing much to the benefit of young surgeons also. Professor Mandeep Singh Dillan is my screen there? Is my screen? We cannot see your screen, sir. You'll have to share it again. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, I am just sharing it. Is the screen there? Yes. Boss, it's coming. It's coming. Okay, okay, okay. Dr. Mandeep Singh Dhillan is professor and head department of orthopedic surgery at PGI Chandigarh. He has his degrees MS Ortho, FA, MS, FRCS, England. He is head department of physical medicine and rehabilitation and consultant in charge sports medicine clinic at PGI Chandigarh. He is former dean physiotherapy sports medicine at Baba Farid Court University. Baba Farid University. He has been past president of Indian Orthopedic Association. He is chairman, chairperson research AO Trauma Asia Pacific. Past chairperson, EO Trauma India, founder, president, Indian Biologics uh, Orthopedic Society. He is past president, Indian Orthoplasty Association, 
past president in जर्नल ऑफ इसेकॉ हेलो डॉक्टर सरोज सर हेलो अरे वी सीम टू हैव लॉस्ट हिम माय रिक्वेस्ट माय रिक्वेस्ट टू प्रोफेसर डिलन सर प्लीज स्टार्ट योर वीडियो ओके आई डू द स्क्रीन शेयरिंग थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सर ओके uh hello uh good evening everybody thank you from members of the uttarakhand uh, orthopedic association uttaranchal thank you so much for inviting me i have got lots of friends over there and thank you neeraj and shantanu and dr naresh to be part of this along with me i am going to give a small talk about 10 15 minutes about syndesmosis injuries it's, it's the one of the common things one of the common injuries one of the most commonly discussed but the question is do we understand them fully so to understand them we have to see where we go with this and the learning objectives of this talk are going to be understand the anatomy and instability caused by injury of the syndesmosis realize that stabilization of the ankle complex is a key point not only focusing on this injury but we also have to understand the fixation oblique stabilization technique and the methods used now to understand syndesmosis injuries you have to go back 50 years in the past in the 1970s not all ankle fractures were fixed but people started recognizing that syndesmosis was a cause of potential late problem and they started stabilizing the syndesmosis but the controversy was they never understood which case to fix and how to do it and at that time we started getting syndesmosis anatomy papers etc as our understanding of this issue or this anatomy uh, evolved then in the 1980s people started to understand more about the significance of syndesmosis instability most late problems including taylor shift which we now recognize very easily was attributed to syndesmosis widely and then open reduction and fixation of the ankle became a norm and along with it for unstable syndesmosis it was recommended that the syndesmosis should be stabilized along came the 1990s the focus actually shifted a lot onto the syndesmosis itself as a predominant stabilizing factor and every such syndesmosis was fixed with screws especially in all weber c and many weber b fractures the motto in that time was if you are in doubt about syndesmotic instability you might as well fix it then the century turned some facts became better understood people realized that it was not only the syndesmosis but for stabilizing the syndesmosis fibular reduction is the key and then this thought that maybe we are over emphasizing putting the screw through the syndesmosis and not looking at the ankle as a whole and then they also found out that so many of these cases which screws had been put had a syndesmosis mal reduction and then 10 years ago the methods of fixation changed dynamic fixation came into vogue the ring concept of ankle injuries was understood 
and which would you it was realized that all syndesmosis injuries need not to be screwed in inverted commas now implant removal which was the key thing to be done after syndesmotic fixation also became controversial so what's happening today in 2021 we have a better understanding of the ring complex and we try to repair the so-called ring of the ankle which i will explain as we go along and we can also understand that syndesmotic stability can be indirectly restored and then as we know from the crossbat trial published out of australia there is an evolving role of non-operative treatment of ankle fractures so like there are 10 commandments today i'm going to give you 10 tips for managing syndesmosis injuries now the tip number one you have to understand that the syndesmosis anatomy as well you have to understand the ring concept of uh, ankle instability and what i mean by that i'll go on to show when you look at the syndesmosis there are four major ligaments you have the ligament in the front you have the ligament at the back you have the interosseous ligament which goes right up there and then you have a small inferior transverse ligament again uh, at the tibiofibular level now we also need to understand that the mechanism of injury determines the type of syndesmotic injury we get in a pronation external injury you will get a different pattern whereas in a supination external injury you will get partial or complete or again different pattern the avulsions are from different areas of the bone now look at this supination external rotation injury it's a classic oblique fibular fracture but there is no medial instability so this is a stable fracture and you don't really need a reduction and you can do it by closed management but if you look at another fracture with a similar lateral oblique fibular fracture the thing you notice is the medial malleolus or maybe a deltoid ligament injury with a tailor shape this is an unstable syndesmosis and this needs reduction and this needs fixation similar to pronation external rotation injury almost all of them have a medial injury and a significant syndesmosis damage which needs to be fixed and you also have to understand where the fibular fractures are because they could be shortening they could be rotation and understanding this is important for us to understand syndesmosis reduction techniques now the ring concept of the ankle came into work like the pelvis the ankle mortis is also a ring with four major components and whenever more than two are involved the ring is unstable and you have to bring back the center, the stability of the ankle to get back a good outcome so you have to understand that we need to reconstitute this ring tip number two whenever you want an accurate syndesmotic reduction you have to make sure that fibular length and rotation are brought back to normal otherwise you can never reduce the syndesmosis and i'll show you a couple of examples because you understand look at this fibula it's rotated the talus has shifted medially and unless you understand the fibular reduction you're never going to be able to reduce the syndesmosis now high fibular fractures above the syndesmosis invariably have a syndesmosis injury otherwise the fibula can't shift can't break and the old textbooks like the rockwood and grid they advocate that in these cases don't fix the fibula you can get away by fixing the syndesmosis alone i am not a believer in this because i have seen many cases in which where syndesmosis alone is tried to be reduced but the fibula has not been fixed leads to an improper reduction of syndesmosis and in this particular case done many many years ago despite repeated surgeries despite trying to get the fibula back to length ankle osteoarthritis happens at an early stage so you must remember that fibular length and rotations are important for an accurate syndesmotic reduction so you have to do it right the first time because you're never going to get a second chance anyway so tip number three you must evaluate the syndesmosis stability after you have done a stable fibular fixation so this is a key point because after fixing the fibula you may find that the syndesmosis is stable and you may not do it to do anything and there are many ways of doing it you must do it preoperatively 
which is a manual stress examination and under CM aid you can see which of these cases are probably going to have an unstable syndesmosis. You can do it intraoperatively like here you can do it with we call it the hook or spreader test to check the mobility of the fibula and it's important to check the mobility in all planes. You try to push it laterally, you try to rotate it everywhere you see whether this is correctly there or not and you must check it by CM also. Because intraoperatively, if you cannot move it after fixing the fibula, this is a stable syndesmosis and may not require much more than what has been done already. Tip number four, it's an intra-articular injury. Therefore, you have to understand that accuracy of reduction is the key. And as I said, it flows from an accuracy of reduction of the fibular fracture. So when you want an accuracy reduction, you must realize which is the instability in this syndesmosis injury. Louis et al. from Hong Kong have pointed out that the instabilities can be in any plane. I've already talked about the fibular shortening, which is a major part, and that's a longitudinal instability. Most of us look at rotational instabilities, and we forget about coronal instability and sagittal plane instability. And that's where when you've done this test and you put in a screw, you can lead to a sagittal malreduction. And I'll show you some cases where it has been done and people have not realized it. So the best way of checking the accuracy of the syndesmosis is by looking at the anterior lateral aspect of the fibula, get an accurate reduction of the incisora, after fibular length is regained and then you will be able to do it so most times when you are in doubt it may be wise to do an open reduction of the syndesmosis and then fix it with whatever method you want to do indirect methods of checking reduction are good but you have to be experienced enough to make sure that the accuracy of reduction is being maintained now if you want to fix it you have to place the screw properly. And this is tip number five from my point. You know, there's a lot of controversy where to put the screw, two centimeter proximal, five centimeter proximal. The key point is you put it above the syndesmosis, about two centimeters above, but not too high, because if you put it too high, it's an inf ineffective stabilization method. And you have to insert it above the syndesmosis, not through it. Because remember, it's a fibrous joint, and you can damage it. And if you are putting in a screw, please put it at the correct angle. The angle is 30 degrees to the front, not dead lateral, because you want to hit the fibula at the right time. And you want to make sure that when you finish putting the screw, you are not getting any additional glide over there. Now, this is the most important tip. You have to understand that significant malreduction is problem with screws and this case which was fixed and looks good is unfortunately not so good and this has been shown by Gardner that if you look at these cases which look good almost 30 percent of operative syndesmotic fractures will have some mal reduction and this happens in the sagittal plane even in the coronal plane and this is important because unless you check the CT we make an x-ray and say everything is fine but all of them if you do a ct you will find that there is a problem in reduction and this is often the cause of pain after a well fixed syndesmosis or a well fixed ankle joint also so you must understand that the malreductions could be in any plane translational rotational subluxation and the commonest is a push anteriorly or an anterior rotation because you tend to compress the screw and when you compress it you get a problem over there so the step number seven is no compression, firstly at the time of reduction and secondly at the time of inserting the screw. So what you need to understand is most of us use a clamp. So you have to position the clamp and not compress it. And if you want to put the clamp, the medial placement of the clamp is important. You can't put it dead medial. It has to be slightly posterior so that you are, uh, so, so you are preventing posterior translation. But if you put it in the wrong way, you could push it posteriorly or you can push it anteriorly. So what I do is I hold it with a clamp. You put a temporary stabilizing K wire and check it on all the planes and then you fix it or whatever you do. And remember, no compression. There are so many CT scans which we've got which show that the pain of the ankle joint is coming because of over compression of the syndesmosis by either lag screws or vigorous over clamping. 
Tip number eight. If there are so many problems with the screws, why not try dynamic fixation? This does not fix the fibula to the tibia, but holds it in place. And this is something which is coming in. Everybody is aware of the concept of the suture button. And this was talked about as early as the 1990s, when Yamaguchi, who published from the US in 1994, said that maybe you should look at the biomechanical guidelines and omit a trans syndesmotic fixation. Because he says that if you put the screw through the fibula, it reduces fibular rotation and motion, and it could even reduce ankle dorsiflexion and may be a cause of pain. And that is the concept on which all these publications are based, that maybe in the future, not today, I'm not so sure, that dynamic fixation of the syndesmosis may be the key point in the future. Tip number nine, which is very important, and I will come to this more in detail when I talk about the posterior malleolar fractures, you need to reconstruct the ring. And if you've got stability in the rest of the ring, you may not need to transfix the syndesmosis. Now, this is something we must understand that you don't need to have everything. If you're holding it properly from here and here, the ring can be made stabilized. Because when you fix a posterior malleolus with an accurate reduction, it tensions the posterior tibio fibular ligament. It reduces the fibula in the right place. And it also allows some motion and therefore you may not need a syndesmotic fixation in this particular scenario although the syndesmosis was unstable to start with and i'll show you a couple of examples this is a general surgeon in my hospital he was a senior resident at the time when we got his injury he came to us and he you can see there's a weber c fracture fibular rotation large posterior fragment and the syndesmosis has shifted with the distal fibula and this fragment, it's gone there. And this is seen by the fact that you have a large medial joint space. So CT scan will show you that the ring is broken. It's not only the syndesmosis, but the ankle ring, like the pelvis, is broken. So what do you do? We put the fibular plate, we put, did a posterior lateral approach to screw this in and put this in, and the syndesmosis became stable through the ligaments. And because the fibula was held in pl place by these screws through the ligament, the medial joint space also reduced and an additional exposure of the medial side was not required. And therefore, you can avoid a syndesmotic fixation. But again, I say, if you are in doubt, don't miss out on putting an additional screw, but in the right place. And this is he walking comfortably at, you know, at, nine, at five months. He is now a consultant general surgeon at our hospital. Now, sometimes these syndesmotic injuries can be unusual. Now, this is a complex ankle fracture with a small fib, uh, medial malleolus avulsion, but the syndesmosis by and large looks okay. Some comminution in the front. But if you look at it clearly, and you have to take a CT scan to understand this, there is a huge chaput fracture and there is a shift of the fibula. That means this ligament is broken. And therefore, this is almost like a reverse posterior malleolar fracture. You can see at different levels of what is happening. And in this case, we went in, we fixed the chaput fragment, we buttressed it into place, and only one syndesmotic screw was put because there was a posterior injury also. We just made sure that the ring is intact. And on the medial side, we did a little bit of a wire and a, some kind of a tension band suture. And this guy has done well at a three-year follow-up because we were able to reconstruct the ring. Last point, which is always a controversy. You don't have to remove the screws. Take them out only if they are painful or the ankle is not doing too well. So there's a lot of controversy. These articles are recent publications. I think this one was published March last year. And this, the big thing is, should you remove the screw before you start weight bearing? The current consensus doesn't seem to agree because it gives you some stability and the issue is it may break. So I give a tip is that you remove the syndesmotic screw only if it is painful and you wait five, six months, you, it may break. But does it have any consequence if it breaks? If you tell the patient that the screw may break, don't worry about it. If it's actually broken means you're getting fibular motion and that's good for you, they are happy because there is no data that tells you that screw breakage, breakage helps reduce pain. But then there is no data 
that also tells you that screw removal helps to reduce pain. So we really don't know. And the policy of routine removal of screws is now going out of favor. And this is a systematic review published a few uh, years ago that many people say that it should not be removed at all. Only thing is warn the patient that it may break and removing this for, the, for no pain may be unnecessary surgery. So if you ask the average surgeon today, and this is a publication last month, uh, that means July 2021, how would you manage ankle fractures? This was a survey of about more than 200 orthopedic surgeons. Most of them had a variable response, both in their pre-operative and intraoperative assessment, the type of fixation they would use, whether they would remove screws or not, and what would be their post wearing post weight bearing protocol so i'm just trying to tell you even in this year the international literature has no great consensus and that's why i've given this talk because i want to give back some take home messages one is inadequately treated syndesmosis injury can cause long term disability and that's a problem even osteoarthritis of the ankle is there so when you want to treat it understand both the anatomy as well as the injury patterns it needs stabilization, there's no doubt about it. And the commonest method today is use of screws, but they have to be used judiciously because malreduction is a major, major problem. And because of this, dynamic stabilization is coming out as a good, is it coming out as a good solution, especially in sports injuries. But in a fracture scenario, this may not be the best and we don't have enough evidence to say that this is the only direct thing. And you remember, you can also stabilize the syndesmosis indirectly by stabilizing the whole ring. And then you may need to, then you could possibly avoid putting the screw right through the syndesmosis. And in my opinion, screw removal is not mandatory. And those of you who want more details, I'd like you to look at this foot and ankle manual, which is the AO foot and ankle manual where I'm a co-author and it is now released in Davos. Thank you for your time and I am open to questions. Mandeep, yeah. yeah. Can I raise a question, Doctor? Yes, yes. Doctor Mandeep, it was an excellent uh, talk. I'm hearing you after a long time, and uh, you have given us some beautiful suggestions and the real concepts which are coming up in the ankle injuries. I have a small question. You talked about the dynamic stabilization or dynamic fixation of the syndosmosis. Do you have any experience and how many patients have you operated on this using Sir, this we technique? Are about 15, 10, 15 of them, but you know, we are very selective. Now, yep. the commonest thing I do is when you have an isolated syndesmosis injury without a fracture. Now, I have not talked about that because that's a totally yes, different sir. and they are known as high ankle sprains. So these yep. are the patients in which we do it. Now, when I have significant instability where plates, etc. are involved, and I have a problem of maybe not being able to pass a screw. Now, I have an advantage. I have an intraoperative CT available in my... In my uh, in this my was a question which I had in mind. Yes. So, yes. so we can very easily check it, number yes. one. Number two, uh, the key thing which I've learned in the last few years, yes. you have to make up your mind preoperatively, looking at the X-ray, looking at the CT scan, looking at the instability pattern of the foot before you even give your incision that yes this syndesmosis will require stabilization but then you recheck after you fix the major bone the posterior malleolus and the fibula and then you see how much it is unstable if it is unstable you should fix it but then you have to be clever enough to make sure that the whole construct is not spoiled by doing a syndesmotic malreduction yeah. so if you have a high fracture of the fibula and you put a posterior malleolus and then you find it's unstable Maybe instead of a screw, you could get with a tight rope. But most of the tight rope used by us has been in Liz Frank soft tissue injuries and syndesmosis injuries without fractures. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Sir, one question, sir. Uh, sir, in case of uh, bimalleolar fracture, if we are uh, fixing both malleoli, when we have to put uh, the syndesmosis screw, syndesmotic screw, after fixing the both malleoli or after fixing the later malleoli only? After fixing all of them, 
otherwise you will never be able to get the understand the stability which is given by the reconstruction of the ankle ring let us say you have a medial malleolus fracture and you have a lateral fibular plate you see i'm talking about a weber b fracture now you put the fibular plate then you reduce the talus by reducing the medial malleolus the deltoid will take the talus into its place and then you see the instability in the sagittal plane as well as in the rotational plane because in a weber uh, b fracture it's only the anterior ligament which is torn the posterior ligament of the syndesmosis is almost invariably intact because of that and once you've got that and you find that there is no great stability in any plane you can leave it but if you do this stability testing before you fix the medial side and this thing it will move because it moved in the first place also so once you've done your bony reconstruction you take a call on stabilizing it at that time but the standard protocol is most people put a fibular plate and then they put in a syndesmotic screw and then they want to fix the medial side so they've taken the decision beforehand that i want to put a syndesmotic screw but i want to ask those people how many of them have actually gone back and done a ct and shown whether the syndesmosis was reduced properly or not sir but uh, if you are if you are doing a trimalleolar fracture by posterior approach so it it becomes very difficult to put syndesmotic screw because we are doing in floppy lateral position so you can do it in the in a prone position also sir it is easy i have just demonstrated us in this putting a syndesmotic screw in a prone position no if sir if you do a proper prone... posterior lateral approach you can do the fibular fracture you can do the posterior malleolar fracture and even in the prone position what we do now is we flex the knee and we can do on the medial side also oh, there is yes. no problem it's just no. having to understand that ulta dekhna that's all ek do case mein it becomes very easy okay sir sir i have a question and a comment sir if i can yes sir yeah uh, rightly said by dilan sir i personally do all my trimalleolar cases almost invariably in a prone position and as rightly pointed out pointed out by dilan sir it is a matter of you reorienting yourself your mind in a way that you are seeing the patient from posterior not from anterior side now my question to dilan sir is in his uh, lecture he has very nicely uh, told us about the development the history how in 19 uh, 50 years back and 40 years back and 50 and 10 years back so sir my question is, where do you see the latest trend of all this research going into future next 10 years what is the way forward for these syndesmotic injury management no right now i have shared with you where the current status of uh, management is the now the concept is not syndesmotic fixation but syndesmotic stabilization that is what the concept in the word we don't we don't use syndesmotic fixation anymore we use the word is called syndesmotic stabilization whether it is stable by fixing the fibula and the posterior malleolus whether it needs an additional transfixation the word is transfixation of the syndesmosis by a screw or with a tight rope is secondary but the concept is stabilization of the ring of the ankle like the pelvis and whenever we feel that the syndesmosis is still unstable by reconstructing the ring it should be transfixed right sir so another question if i may as you rightly said sir you have the advantage of having a ct scan in your ot now for lesser mortals like us you still advocate that we at the end of fixation just to make sure we just give incision and visually see yeah. whether it is there in incisor or not that is for the reduction i always say a small anterior lateral incision if you are doing a lateral approach for the fibula and you think you are going to be reducing the the syndesmosis and you're not done anything for the posterior malleolus keep this approach slightly anterior because you can retract it and see the incisura that is very very easy it's not a problem at all it's very easy but then some people advocate a small 1 cm incision to look at it i have known rodrigo uh, pesantes who's written an article for the latest journal of uh, uh, the foot and ankle surgery asia pacific about syndesmotic injury they always look at it from the front Yeah. now that concept has become a little shaky because many of us are now going from the back and then having an additional incision in the front becomes so much of an issue but those new concepts 
are also being aided by the availability of new intraoperative uh, uh, visualization devices. Now, I've had people who've talked to me that I have I've seen a trimalleolar fracture or a pylon fracture, but I don't have a CT scan. Then you should not be operating because a 50% chance you'll do a bad job. Absolutely. You should send it to somebody who has these facilities so that we get one chance in these intraarticular fractures. If we do it wrong, we are in trouble. Right. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Dr. Puneet, are there any audience questions? No, 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 not at all. Abhir. No. So, sir, should we move on to the <coughs> next talk? Yeah, sir? sure. Thank you, Professor Dillon. Now we'll be moving to the next talk of Dr. N. K. Agrawal, sir. I will be sharing the screen and introducing Professor. Agrawal. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes, sir. It's visible now. It's going to start. Dr. N. K. Agrawal is MS. Uh, FICS MCH Ortho from Liverpool. He had initial training from the Institute of Medical Sciences, BHU Varanasi. He then did prestigious MCH in orthopedic surgery from the University of Liverpool, UK. He received further training at best centers in UK, USA, and Europe, and also did his orthoplastic fellowship at Charles Center for Joint Replacement Surgery, UK. He has been AO International Fellow at Bond, Switzerland and at Jackson, Mississippi, USA. Apart from working in the UK, he worked as an international expert in orthopedic surgery in Afghanistan. He has traveled around the world, presented papers and delivered more than 125 guest lectures at various international conferences and forums. He is, a, he is an innovative surgeon and has also designed three orthopedic equipments. He returned to India after working in the UK and worked at Professor and Hat at CMC Ludhiana and also Professor and Hat of Orthoplasty and Traumatology at DMC Ludhiana. He is working as Chief Consultant at Joints and Spine Center Ludhiana. Apart from attending 60 courses, symposiums, workshops and other CME programs different parts of the world. Dr. Agarwal has continuously updated himself with the latest advantage, advances in the field of orthopedic surgery, especially in the hip and knee, joint replacement surgery, spine and foot and ankle surgery. By visiting and working at various centers of excellence in Europe, USA. These centers include Royal Liverpool Hospital, Wellington Hospital, Hull Royal Infirmary, Mayo Clinic, Grimsey Hospital, Switzerland, Chandler's Hip Center, Jackson, Mississippi, USA, King College Hospital, London, Royal London Hospital, uh, he is organizational, he has a special, he organized many conferences. He has passion for teaching, honest research, innovation and a surgical and meticulous surgical technique. He has a long list of awards and achievements and uh, he has been past president of Indian Foot and Ankle Society. He has been past president of NAILS he has organized many conferences. I would request Dr. N.K. Agrawal sir to please share your screen. Welcome Dr. Agrawal. Uh, many thanks uh, Dr. Sirohi first for invitation and then elaborate introduction. Let me correct one part of your introduction. I was never president of Foot and Ankle Surgery. I was just the vice president. 
Oh. No, I did organize. You are awesome. So it is all right. It, it, it is all right. That is just a political aspect, but uh, still I needed to correct that. Uh, so let me okay. quickly start sharing my screen. And uh, I have been asked to talk about pylon fractures today. It's classification, the anatomy, and the uh, management principles. So I'm going to share my screen. And I hope it uh, starts coming in a minute. As, uh, can you see my screen? It is coming, sir. Right. Yes. So that is, yeah, uh, that is my talk. And uh, let me. Uh, hang on, it's not moving. Uh, I'm, yeah, that's all right. It's a bit slow. So I have just divided for the sake of simplicity. I will in, give a small introduction about uh, pylon fractures. What are the various classification systems and management principles? What is evidence in literature and what has been my personal experience? And hopefully I will leave you with a small uh, take home message, uh, which at the end of the talk, which you may find of some help. Now, pylon fractures, distal tibial metaphyseal fractures with involvement of the articular surface have traditionally considered pylon fractures. The term was introduced by a French radiologist because the distal tibial metaphysis is shaped like a pharmacist vessel, which is also called pylon. So they call it pylon fracture. But the shape is like that of the pylon. These are usually very high energy and complex serious injuries resulting from compression and sometimes from torsional forces as talus gets driven into the tibial plane. So these are not very simple injuries. These are fairly complex injuries, intra-articular injuries, and can have serious implications if not managed adequately. Now, the mechanism of injury determines the fracture pattern. The mechanism of injury can be that you can have an injury with plantar flex foot or a plantigrade foot or a dorsiflex foot. And these are the three broad mechanisms when an ankle gets injured, uh, to, uh, resulting in a pylon fracture. And in all these types, the Fracture patterns can be different, so their management can differ. These are some of the examples of pylon fractures. You can see here, this is the injury when you get, and this uh, they can be associated with dislocation sometimes, and these are complex injuries, as you can see. Often, they could be associated with soft tissue trauma. They constitute about 5 to 10% of all tibial fractures. It can be isolated or a part of polytraumatized patients. And... Sometimes there can be dis, uh, dislocation of the ankle as well, along with the pylon fractures. Uh, unfortunately, there's no unanimity on the, of, on the treatment policies of these fractures. It depends on the nature of injury, expertise and experience, and also the preference of surgeons. There are a variety of methods, and I will discuss them. Some, it has a significant complication rate because it is an intra-articular injury weight-bearing joint. Development of post-traumatic osteoarthritis is very likely as a late-stage complication of these injuries. Wound breakdown, pain problems, infection, malunion, delayed union, non-union, all these are the complications which can be enumerated. Now, there have been various classification systems to describe these injuries. Most commonly used today and more the... You know, the first one which was described was Rudy and Elgoubert's classification. Still, today in clinical practice, this is the common classification being used. After that, there has been AO classification, like for all fracture and all injuries. And lately, there has been CT-based classification by Topless Jackson and Atkins. And I will briefly talk about these classification as that is part of my job today. Now, this is the simplest method of classifying on the top, you can see type 1, where there is hardly any displacement, though there is involvement of intra-articular uh, uh, you know, cartilage. Type 2, there is displacement of the articular fragments. And type 3, gross comminution and gross metaphysial involvement. These are very serious injuries. So this is the basic classification which has been uh, put forward about, uh, you can say, about 50 years back. And that is still in use in clinical practice. Type 1, type 2, type 3, as I've already shown. I won't go into the further details. Uh, AO classification is part of the comprehensive system of classifying. As we know, 
AO, but in practice, it's very difficult to say what AO classification has immediately as you see the fracture, you can't classify them, you can't memorize all these. This is more for recording and comparative studies and data recording, AO classification. You know, they are type A, type B, type C. Type A means there is no joint involvement. Type B means there is some joint involvement. Type C means there is extensive joint involvement. And then type A, type B, type C can be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So it is more for recording of injuries and uh, doing comparative uh, analysis of different methods of treatment from different uh, places and centers. So again, I don't think there's any point in going into the details I've outlined here. Now these classification again, there is, uh, it has a good observer agreement at, at the type level, but then again at the, uh, you know, uh, different uh, subcategory level, the, uh, the intra-observer agreement is not that good. And in most classifications, it is there. Now, the most recent one is the uh, topless jackson Atkins classification, which is based on CT scan and different types of fragments which can occur. They have named different fragments uh, which are commonly seen in pylon fractures, and they've described the anatomy for each fragment. And then they have made certain groups of fractures into one family. So there are four different families of fractures, whether it's a cor the main fracture is coronal or sagittal, or is it grossly comminuted or it is unclassified. So there are four families. I will quickly show these. The type of fragments can be, you can see here medial anterior posterior, anterolateral, posterolateral, and medial. These are the types of fragments. And then there can be dye punch. When the callus goes in, there can be a fragment which can go into the metaphysis as for a dye punch fragment. So these are the main six types of fragments which can be seen in uh, pylon fractures. All fragments may not be there in every pylon fracture, as is, can be understood. Now, coronal fractures are the vast majority of the pylon fractures if it come into the family of coronal fractures. Some of them, uh, next common is the sagittal family. And then there can be few which are unclassifiable or grossly common. Now, these are the coronal. You can see the mediolateral fracture line, primary fracture line is mediolateral. And then there, there are subgroups. We don't need to go into the details. Then there is sagittal. Here, the main fracture line, you can see is anteroposterior rather than mediolateral. And then there are different fragments you can see. And the, with the fragments, again, can be one of these, all, some or all of the six types. Now, apart from des describing the fracture based on the uh, bony comminution or bony fragments, we have to classify the fractures based on the soft tissue injuries. The conventional method is Gustlo classification, uh, open injuries for open fractures, but this has been further refined by Austin and Shirley, and they they have classified they have uh, you know defined the soft tissue injury. Even in closed fracture, there can be different types of soft tissue injuries, grade 0, 1, 2, 3. And in open fractures, again, there can be different types of soft tissue injuries. So soft tissue injuries are described on this, this classification, and bony injuries are described by the other three classification system. And Rudy and Elgover remains the most commonly used in clinical practice. You know, various classification systems describe the different fracture patterns and severity of injury. The basic objective of any classification is number one, communication. Communication and data preservation and analysis for research. That is one part of the use of uh, fracture classification. The more important clinical utility of a fracture classification in prognosticating the result of an injury and in help in planning of the treatment. So all these classifications have different pros and cons. And, uh, but in general, in our routine clinical practice, the plain radiographs are enough to make a diagnosis. But CT scan can be helpful in, assess in assessing the extent of injury and planning the exact treatment plan and reconstruction of the ankle joint. Normally, we must take full length film. It's a traditional teaching that the joint above and joint below the fracture must be included when you are assessing an injury to a bone or a joint. Not joint above, the knee should be included in these x-rays. Now, what are the principles of management of these uh, complex injuries? 
the goals of treatment in this case is first of all restore the articular congruence and axial alignment. Once you have restored that, then you must ensure that the joint is stable so that we can expect the restoration of joint function. And then of course, soft tissue, there is soft tissue damage. If there is one, we have to uh, manage that depending on the type of soft tissue damage and the merit it deserves. Various modalities of treatment, you know, from earlier times in the historic times until today, skeletal traction, close reduction and cast, close reduction, percutaneous minimal internal fixation with or without external fixation, open reduction internal fixation with plates or nail and next fix, just X fix only as a primary treatment. And these days in the last 10 to 15 years, the two stage procedures have become very popular. And then of course, sometimes you need primary arthrodesis as well when you feel that it can't be reconstructed. So it is better to fuse it on day one. Sometimes, very rarely it can happen. It can be the necessity. As I said earlier, the choice of treatment depends largely on the patient's condition, facilities available, surgeon's expertise and preference. It is however necessary to assess the soft tissue damage as well, extent of joint involvement and the degree of combination to plan the most suitable treatment strategy. It may not be possible that on day one, you can execute the whole treatment. On day one, you may execute a part of the treatment. So it has to be a overall plan and strategy of which you need to know what to execute when. Associated comorbidities and other injuries, if it is a polytraumatized patient, can also influence the choice and timing of treatment for the pilot effect. Type 1 injuries, here I'm referring to Rudy and Elgova classification with minimum displacement can be treated either conservatively or with percutaneous minimal internal fixation, K by the screws. However, type 2 and type 3, simple percutaneous fixation are not enough and because it leads to high complication. So these injuries need more elaborate treatment, more better understanding of the fracture configuration and the soft tissue. Open reduction and internal fixation with plates has been the preferred method of treatment of these fractures for quite some time. However, as this method were, was being used for some, some years, in last 10 to 15 years, it has been observed that it is associated with high rate of soft tissue problems and infection, especially in situations where soft tissues are not very healthy. So advent of minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis and development of low profile locking plates have to an extent helped reduce these complications related to soft tissue and infection, but they have not altogether, uh, you know, we have not yet altogether got rid of these uh, issues. Now, what is evidence in literature about what could be the best method of treatment? You know, there are various studies in literature which compare one treatment with the other, whether it is open reduction, internal fixation, external fixation, types of external fixation, fibular fixation, role of fibular fixation. However, all these studies have got limitations because most of these are retrospective studies. There are some prospective studies, but then there is no, uh, you know, uh, equivalent cases, enough equivalent cases in each of the comparative models. The sphere injuries are often x fixed so they can't be compared with the ones who, who have had plate impact because they are not that sphere. So quite often there is some screw fixation, limited screw fixation, and that again uh, jeopardizes the comparison. And at the end of the day, most of the studies say that the results will depend on severity of injury and accuracy of the reduction of articular surface, which, which is not a rocket science. We all know that as orthopedic surgeons that uh, severity of injury will determine the overall result. And of course, if it, there is an intraarticular involvement, which in pylon fracture is always there, the accuracy of, of uh, reduction of particular surface is of paramount importance. Now, what do these studies say? This is a random control trial it, between open reduction and external fixation with limited internal fixation. They said it, they're almost similar results 
whereas there is another prospective study with severe, uh, you know, for open reduction and internal fixation, especially when there was soft tissue injury, they said severe wound complications. So not really uh, good for these patients. Open reduction. Now, then there was a comparative study about 20 years back between open reduction and internal fixation. MIPO and two stage, that is first external fixation, once the soft tissue stabilizes and then do MIPO. They found that the best results have been with MIPO. And this has been the latest trend in management of most of these injuries. Similarly, with Ilizorum and operation or open reduction internal fixation, very little difference. Both have got complications. This meta analysis of various methods again didn't contribute much. Over in selecting one method over the other. Joint spanning fixation when we used or joint sparing fixation, it is, the studies have shown that if there is, you are taking the fixator across the joint, if there can be an articulation on the fixator which can allow intermittent mobilization of the ankle, the results are better, the ankle mobility, restoration of mobility is better. This is the basic gist of these papers. Now, another study is initially, if there's a fibular fracture that is fixed straight away and then spanning aspects, they found the minimal wound complications. Another study, primary ORIF versus external fixation and external fixation and delayed MIPO. Three different methods. Again, two stage, first x fix and then delayed MIPO gave the best results with minimal complications. Now, I will share some of uh, our cases and experiences with external fixation. I'm quite fond of external fixation if there's an open injury here and a fracture like this. I would do minimal internal fixation, fix the fibula and use an external fixation uh, device to stabilize the fracture. You can see it here. And sometimes like a fracture like this, relatively simple, I would still use minimal internal fixation, restore the articular surface and alignment and then if there is a wound, it can be taken care of and then we can add the articulation on the fixator as you can see here and allow movement of the ankle while the fracture is being taken care of and the soft tissue is being managed. Now I will share one case here. You can see this case, this is quite a severe case. Uh, you can see talus, multiple fragments, all comminuted. The, the problem here, there is subluxation of the ankle joint also. The problem here was that it was a polytraumatized patient and in huge shock. So this fracture took back seat. The first priority was to stabilize the patient and associate uh, other associated injuries, fracture spine, pelvic fracture, sacral injuries, open fractures of the leg. All those needed to be stabilized first. And then after a couple of weeks, we could come to the ankle fracture. And this was an ankle fracture where the principle of external fixation, minimal internal fixation was used. Now we restored the articular surface of the fracture with minimal internal fixation. Every fragment was picked up meticulously and put back. It, they, and then you can see the external fixator was not used because the patient had other injuries and it was difficult to turn the patient. So we used pin and plaster. as a, it, it, it acted like an external fixation, spanning fixator. And this is the, you know, the arthritis was inevitable. This is about uh, uh, eight or nine years post-op, post-operative. But however, despite that arthritis, he still has good function and there is very little pain. And now it is more than 10 years post-injury and he's still moving around, doing all his activities of daily life without much pain. He's eventually going to need arthrodesis that he knows and we know, but at least he has had a useful ankle for about 15 years after this minimal uh, internal fixation without any complication, despite being hugely, uh, you know, serious uh, patient with multiple associated injuries. External fixation can be used in variety of ways in these fractures. It, it can be considered in open injuries. It should always be used either as a stop gap arrangements as a first stage or sometimes even as a definitive treatment and after reconstruction of articular cartilage. And as I said, now there is a move towards combination of initial external fixation followed by internal fixation 
once you are sure that your soft tissues are all right and your infection uh, has been um, reduced, the chances of infection are reduced to minimum. Overall, from literature, there is no conclusive evidence of one type of treatment being or a fixator being superior than the other. Comparative studies have failed to prove superiority of one method over the other. Skin problem infections are higher with the use of plates and pin problems are there sometimes with external fixation. So are mild union and delayed union. So all these problems are there. There is no evidence of one method being superior than the other method. The treatment, it continues to evolve. It has evolved over the past century and the newer improvements continue. The present consensus is towards a two-stage method. Number one, first preference, or if you want to just stay away from plates, minimal internal fixation to restore the articular surface and then external fixation. That also, both these things have given good results. Here is one example of initial external fixation, very bad soft tissue, though there is no big wound. After the wounds are all right, then you do MIPO and you can expect a good result. So what is my message uh, to you friends? My message is that pylon fracture usually associated with significant soft tissue, which may be open or closed. Classification system describe fracture patterns and severity of injury. They should help, they do help in planning the tree, most important. Primary plate fixation has a high complication rate. There is enough evidence to say that at least. Primary X switch with minimal internal fixation or a two stage treatment with initial X switch followed by delayed MIPO give almost similar results with minimal complications. So you can choose depending on what you prefer, depending on what you are comfortable at doing. Uh, I would like to acknowledge some of the articles from where I have picked up some uh, diagrams and images. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The presentation is now open for discussion. Please unmute yourself, sir. So can I make a comment, sir? Yes, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Sir, Namaskar. Uh, I'm Dr. Chahan speaking from this side. You think you need to introduce you to me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, it was really a pleasure hearing you and uh, it was a wonderful talk and the message is very clear to all of us that every patient having an ankle injury, especially the pilot fractures, they are not so simple to treat. We always need to be very cautious about these injuries. Majority of the times they are compound injuries. Majority of the time they are compound injuries because ankle is a very superficial, the bones are very superficial. We have a lot of tendons over there. The muscle coverage is very less. So they have their own problems. And as we have very clearly stated, we always need to go for two-stage procedure to be on the safer side. If really these injuries have to be managed. So once we have taken care of the soft tissues, we can always go for definitive fixation. And every patient is a case in itself and needs to be managed on an individual basis. We cannot have a straight formula for every ankle injuries, and especially the pylon fractures. So it was really a wonderful talk and uh, nice hearing you. And the message which we all got is very straightforward. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Agrawal, sir, this is Shantanu. Yes, Chandra. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful talk, sir. It was a pleasure to hear you speak, as always. Uh, the message that has again been reiterated by Dr. Vijendra Chauhan, sir, uh, that is truly that these fractures are primarily a soft tissue injury in which the bone is also broken, number one. And we really cannot have one size fit all kind of approach. And every patient is unique in itself. And we need to have a clear understanding of the principles, guiding principles, 
and then we have to be judicious in application of those principles on the individual merit of all those cases thank you sir thank you thank you shanti sir i have one more question yes so do you have any experience of uh, articular cartilage transplants also especially uh, in these patients in later stages uh, because sometimes no, in pylon fractures you may have lot of damage of the articular cartilage yes. on the dome side so uh, do no, you go for articular cartilage transplantations also uh, no no vijender i have no personal experience nor uh, have i seen enough literature on this i know it is a evolving and a futuristic uh, aspect of orthopedic science uh, but as of now nothing has become a routine clinical practice right so in many cases maybe you would be getting uh, malunited fractures or fractures with a lot of infection so uh, what is your experience of using uh, uh cal synthetic calcium sulfate impregnated with antibiotic something like stimulan from biocomposite now uh, shantanu i i think there are two different aspects to your question you said sometimes you may be getting some neglected malunited fractures yeah now neglected malunited pylon fracture is a separate sub and in them now now second aspect is using antibiotic impregnated bone substitutes yes now they can be used anywhere why only neglected they can be used even in fresh open fracture yeah so uh, i do use them uh, fairly liberally when i suspect that it is a very contaminated fracture yes. and when i suspect that yes uh, infection is very likely when I, if i have to do expect i in such cases obviously i don't do uh, plating or any inter on uh, massive interoperation and if i do expect i do put these uh, antibiotic loaded uh, bioabsorbable uh, uh, you know uh, materials yes or bone substitutes yep. and uh, they are very good very useful very useful and sometimes in infected nodules to control the local infection um, i am very very fond of them and i have found them extremely useful that is a completely subject all together and uh, 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 yes, uh, your, the answer to your question is yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I also found them very useful, and uh, primarily as this question for the benefit of my audience, for the newer surgeons, for the new hands who would really be interested in knowing this aspect of treatment as well, sir. Thank you, sir. Doctor Puneet, are there any audience questions? No sir, there is no not an audience question. Okay, okay. So, if the discussion part is over, sir, should we move to the last talk? Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, Dylan, sir, I would request you to please share the screen. Okay. Uh, thank you. I am going to be sort of. I'll put this here. i'm going to be talking about posterior malleolus fractures now since we've talked about syndesmosis we've talked about the complex pylon fractures i'm going to be talking again about a bit of a controversial subject which is the posterior malleolus fracture because there's so much debate whether you should fix them or not and i think that there is now is the time to put it to rest and i'm going to explore whether there is enough evidence to routinely fix them now what exactly is the posterior malleolus is that anatomic prominence formed by the posterior inferior margin of the tibial articular surface and many people have called it the third malleolus or whatever you want to call it but it contributes significantly to the ankle joint when we look at the ankle joint in the concept of a ring or as a concept of the weight bearing part of the distal tibia now what well, if we get this here somewhere Now, the debate which is going on today is when to fix and should we fix and this consensus meta analysis recently done showed that the literature doesn't really understand what fragment sizes of the posterior medial uh, 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 posterior malleolus fracture should be fixed 
And I, I brought this slide in because they're still looking at fragment sizes of the posterior malleolus. And I'll show you that it's not the size which is important. There are other aspects to a posterior malleolus which are that much more important. Now, the questions that need to be answered that or need to be understood. Let's go here. Uh, firstly, are all posterior malleolar fractures the same? Secondly, do we need specialized radiology which would influence treatment? Thirdly, do we really understand the instability caused when a posterior malleolus fracture occurs? And fourthly, are we discussing reduction or are we discussing maintenance of reduction? And all this is interrelated with one another and the concepts which we are going to talk about are going to reflect on these four points. Now, whenever there is a posterior malleolus fracture, there is no doubt it's an intra-articular injury. It will lead to incongruity. There will be cartilage damage and there will be ultimately arthritis if not properly treated. But the issues which are debatable or the contentious issues are many of us are not really sure how exactly to evaluate the joint instability with this posterior malleolus fracture. There is no consensus on radiological measurements and there is no consensus on the method of achieving stability. And that is where the ring concept comes in because the stability is achieved both directly as well as indirectly. Now this study by Odak et al, they published it in the Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery about five years ago. They looked at 33 studies with more than 950 patients reviewed and they found that any ankle which had a posterior malleolus fracture had a poorer outcome then compared to a bimalleolar fracture. And the outcome was related to the fracture displacement, to the article congruency, which could be restored, and whether any residual tibio-tailor subluxation was left. So that means that if this were not accurately reduced, the outcome would be that much poorer. To date, or maybe till about two, three years ago, in my knowledge, there was a division of the malleolus into three or four components, depending upon the size of the posterior malleolar fragment. And this was calculated as a percentage of the distal tibial articular surface, and which no longer is considered to be the way to go about. Because when they looked at it biomechanically and clinically, with them, when they evaluated these fractures, in the literature, they could find no consensus about what size of fractures should be fixed or should not be fixed. And that was what has been discussed for the last 20 years. If it's a big size or a small size, we need to fix it or we don't need to fix it. So today we know there is not enough evidence to suggest that fragment size dictates treatment. So this is important. So there are other factors which influence decision making. And therefore, these, although we know for a fact that indirectly, we know if there's a large fragment, it needs fixation. That goes without saying. But the factors which influence our decision making are more than size alone. What about the classification? The standard classifications, which are Dennis Weber and Log Hansen, do not look at the posterior malleolus at all. They say in the Log Hansen, the last stage, SCR4 or PER4, would be a posterior malleolus fracture. But nobody talks about the severity of fractures, and these are not at all prognostic. Now, we have classifications which look at posterior malleolus and they define the instability which is associated with these. Now, the most accepted classification is that by Haraguchi, who classified these fractures, CT based, please remember, according to the orientation of the fracture line. You have the commonest, which is a posterior lateral oblique type, and then you have a lesser percentage about 20 percent which are the ones in which the fracture line extends medially and then you have a small shell type which is about 10 to 14 percent of the cases but often this is not enough because when you look at the ct scans you see so many other things you see that the posterior fragment may have a sagittal split there could be articular impaction and there could be medial extension right into the medial malleolus. And which makes it, I used to call them something like atypical ankle fractures because these were neither pylons nor are they 
simple malleolus fractures. My friend Stefan Remelt, with one of his uh, colleagues, Jan Bartonek from uh, Czechoslovakia, they have come out on a CT based classification which takes into account the fragment size, the shape and location of the fragment, the degree of ankle instability, and whether the fibular notch into which the syndesmosis reduces or the fibula reduces is, in, is intact or is not intact. So the type one is a simple, small fragment. This does not go into the notch. It is a, just a sort of a flake shell fragment. And when you've done other things, this most probably will not need fixation. If you fix the fibula, you fix the medial malleolus, this shell fracture type one will not need any fixation. Now the type two is bigger. It's a variable size posterior lateral involvement, but it should involve less than half of the notch, one third or one fourth of the notch. This is slightly more unstable. It is associated with Weber C fractures where the fibula is higher, the syndesmosis is ruptured. And here the incidence of fixing these fractures is that much more uh, and the requirement is that much more. Now the third is a posterior medial two part fragment. Now this is a large fragment which involves the medial malleolus. This involves half of the incisura. And when it goes into the medial malleolus, it could also have a sagittal split. So there could be two separate fragments. And this needs fixation. This needs stabilization. And most of the time, you would have to add a posterior medial approach to fix these types of fractures. The type three Bartonic fractures. You see, there are two, two separate fragments. Even if you fix this and you leave this, you will have a problem at the long run. And the type four, is a large posterior lateral triangular fragment. I call it, it's a transitional plafond fractures and all need fixation and all need to be done by a posterior lateral approach. There's a small group which is unclassifiable. I'm not going to talk about it. So where do we stand today in our understanding of posterior malleolar fractures? We now know that newer evidence has said that the best outcomes are with screw and plate fixation of the posterior malleolus. Now, if there is an unstable trimalleolar fragment and there is an associated tailor shift, which is most commonly to the back or even to the lateral side, your threshold for going in to fix these should be very, very low. So what should we know? When you, there is a posterior malleolar fracture, we must use three things. We must use our experience. We must evaluate the evidence and we must apply our judgment. And that's how I go in all cases of this. So let's see the experience. This lady, 55 year old controlled diabetic. I saw her in 2005 and six. She had a small history of a twist in the hills with a low energy trauma. And she came to us. We were able to do an immediate close reduction. And after a few days, when the soft tissue swelling subsided, this is the close reduction done. It looked damn good. And we were at that time calculating the size of the posterior malleolar fragment. There's a great Taylor's congruity and there's no great syndesmotic instability. So that's what we did. We got a fibular reduction. This was severely comminuted through a medial approach. We put it on this and we said that the posterior malleolus doesn't need to be fixed. It's less than 25% because that was the consensus among surgeons at that time. She walked, she had pain and she got a minor stumble after nine months. And you start seeing the abnormal patterns over here and the fact that this is not uniting and maybe the talus is not in the correct position. In addition, she had a restricted dorsiflexion and a painful limb. And when you got a CT scan done, you can see that none of these fragments has united. The fibula has shifted with the posterior malleolus to the back. These two are still open and she has what we call as a disrupted ankle. And this is probably because the posterior fragment was not addressed correctly on day one. She ultimately broke her implants the pain worsened and the ankle had to be fused. But we learned a lesson 15 years ago that we cannot neglect these cases. So let's use our judgment. Another obese lady 
right ankle there's a forced flexion inversion no axial impact so we are not so worried about the comminution involved over here and you look at the ct scan as i said in the in the syndesmotic injuries the ring of the ankle is disrupted. You have a medial injury, you have a posterior injury, you have a lateral injury, and you have a syndesmotic disruption. You can see it in all the CT scan with a degree of impaction somewhere down the line. So let's evaluate the instability. In the front view, the lateral structures are unstable. In the medial view or whatever view, you can see that the medial structures are also gone because you can see the tailor shift and the syndesmosis is disrupted and most importantly the posterior structures which add to the stability have also been disrupted so the ankle ankle mortis is disrupted at multiple levels and we have to reconstruct this ring and i repeat it in all my talks look at the ankle like you would look at the pelvis so this ring needs to be reconstructed and let's see what was done for this lady after stability, this is not my case, by the way, this is given to me by Paulo Barbosa. The lateral structures were made stable. The posterior malleolus was fixed by two screws. But is it stable? Because what will happen over time is that after three or four weeks, you can see what's happening. The talus is shifting to the back because this is not so stable. The talus is shifting along with the fibula into a degree of external rotation and the medial space is opening up. And why is this happening is because the posterior comminution and osteoporosis was not appreciated and the posterior fragments were not buttressed enough and maybe the syndesmosis also was not fixed and the medial injury and syndesmosis were left unstable, making the ring unstable. So when she was taken up for surgery the second time, the posterior malleolus was buttressed, the syndesmosis was fixed, the fibula was refixed, which led to the medial side not requiring fixation, and they still got a stable construct. So you must understand the fixation modalities. Only if it is small and stable should a posterior malleolus be fixed with screws. And the stability depends upon the classification on the tailor shift. Most other cases, and I would say 80% of the other cases, need a buttress plate from the back. Yeah. Let's show you another example. I showed you this doctor in my syndesmotic talk also. You can see the Weber C and the medial joint space and the posterior malleolus. And that's what the CT scan shows, that there is a disrupted link. Here we treated him first with an X-fix and a primary fibular plating to get the length right because there was a lot of soft tissue swelling. In the second stage, we went in through a posterior medial approach and you can see we marked the sural nerve over there. And this is the prone position. We had a discussion about the prone position and this is the prone position and you can go in, open up the joint and you have to identify the sural nerve. And in this particular case, if you notice, the sural nerve has different branches. There are two separate branches which both have to be protected before you can the sec between the peroneae and the posterior muscles over here. Then you go in, retract the peroneae, be careful of the posterior, uh, uh, the sural nerve, and go right down to the bone. And by cutting the fascia and retracting the flexor, you are right down onto the posterior malleolus, and you can actually elevate all the soft tissues. And you have a huge area of bone available for us to reduce and put the plate or the screws, whatever we want to do. Now, this is not the same case, but whenever you put a plate on the posterior malleolus, it has to be molded. If you are bringing it right down to the end, but if you are using screws and a plate, then the molding is not that important. So in this particular case, we used two screws and a molded buttress plate. And after we had done this, because the fibula had been fixed, we found that the talus would not move. So that the syndesmosis was intact and the medial structures did not need an additional this thing. And this guy has done well without even a syndesmotic fixation because as I've showed you earlier, if you have an accurate reduction and stabilization and the posterior ligament and the interior ligament is intact by retensioning them and getting fibular length, 
you may be able to avoid syndesmotic fixations. And that's what happened. He is walking comfortably and now he is a consultant surgeon at my hospital. Many times, I think about 30% of the time, you have a large posterior medial fragment and that is fragmented. It is broken up into two places and then you have to go posteriorly, posterior medially. You can do it in a supine position. You can flip it. We are comfortable by doing it even in a prone position. But the key point is when you are going posterior medial, you expose both of the fragments together. Try and stabilize the medial one first because the talus is attached to it because of the strong deltoid ligament. Reduce it, then fix and reduce both the medial and lateral segment and you will be able to get a stable ring reconstruction which allows early non-weight bearing mobilization. So folks, what's the consensus? If you look at all the publications which come recently, we need to combine experience evidence and judgment and as has been discussed by the speakers before me we have to evaluate each fracture as an individual case and not apply one principle to all fractures for their management so okay. i want to talk about four facts from our experience and evidence we know that whenever there is a posterior malleolar fragment that means whenever there is a trimalleolar fragment that ankle has got more severe trauma than a bimalleolar fragment and the outcomes are going to be worse anyway. So these guys are going to get a worse outcome. So it is better to stabilize all aspects to minimize this worse outcomes. Fact two, if you look at the ring concept, it is biomechanically a great advantage to fix the posterior malleolus. You reduce the weight bearing stresses, you reduce the chances of post-traumatic uh, osteoarthritis. And fact three, our judgment. Now we no longer talk about the size. We follow the classification and we know from the evidence presented by the classifications that there are certain types of posterior malleolus fractures which invariably are going to need a stabilizing procedure which involves posterior fixation. And from the evidence and experience, we also know that we indirectly stabilize the syndesmosis. I've been telling you in both my talks, this would improve functional outcome. And the fifth most important fact, published after a service of uh, by evidence, evidence, experience and judgment is that many surgeons don't fix the posterior malleolus because they're not comfortable with the posterior approach. They think that technically it is difficult, prone position is not comfortable, so they, so they don't put off, they put off fixing the posterior malleolus because of this. So the take home points are posterior malleolar fracture needs to be understood in totality, not by size alone. You have to understand that there is a broken ring and we have to evaluate the injury mechanisms which are complex and the degree of instability. And the evidence which is emerging is in favor of fixing them. Depending upon the classification, there are some of them which definitely don't need fixation. And remember, the outcomes are worse due to the associated displacement, the articular damage and the instability and accurate reduction and buttressing makes the joint stable, adds to the overall syndesmosis and the ring stability. And today, all experienced surgeons fix them to improve the outcomes. Thank you for giving me a patient here. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, excuse me, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, there is one question from the audience to Dr. Agarwal, sir. Uh, Dr. Agarwal, sir, are you listening? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Uh, Dr. Imran Akhtar from Gorakhpur, he is asking that uh, if you are using the anterior lateral plate, uh, which approach is better for uh, putting anterior lateral plate? And other question is, if uh, uh, they are facing the wound dissense in anterior approach, so what is your suggestion in that case and which approach is better to avoid wound dissense? Now, uh, your question is that if I am using anterolateral plate, let me tell you, I am not at all fond of plates. I rarely, rarely, rarely ever use plates for 
these injuries. But I know they are very popular. Many people are experts in using plates. And if they have to be used, number one, they have to be low profile plates. Antrolateral plate, antrolateral approach, I would say. And wound dehiscence and all that, that is the exact reason why I am not fond of plates, because they would lead to that. There is hardly any soft tissue between skin and bone at this as, uh, you know, Dr. Vajinda Chauhan uh, said as well. So, the direct approach to the fracture with going directly subperiosteal, not taking the soft tissues off in layers at that level. So, these, there are simple basic things of respecting the soft tissues or whatever you have. And whenever soft tissues are compromised, it is always better to avoid or delay at least putting the place. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So there is one question from Dr. Dillon, sir. Sir, uh, is there any uh, specific criteria that uh, for, for this size of uh, posterior mellulus, we should put, we should put uh, this interfrag screw and more than that, we will put one buttress plate. Uh, sir, I I just said that there is no consensus about size. Size doesn't oh. matter. The issue is the instability, the and displacement, and how well you've been able to fix the fibular fracture. Because many of these cases, sometimes you have a commuted fibular fracture, and the stability in the fibula is in doubt. The syndesmosis is disrupted. So whenever, let's say in the proximal tibia, let's forget about the posterior mellulus in the proximal tibia how many of you would just play put plates uh, the put screws alone and not put buttress plates if you can understand the concept there what goes wrong when we look at the inverted proximal tibia in this situation of the posterior mellulus the principle of buttress plate is to hold it in place hold it. even if there is commutation even if there is uh, sort of osteoporosis and the screw tends to loosen out the buttress plate will hold it in place. The biggest problem which modern day surgeons are fearing is because they've been taught or they've grown up with a supine position and a standard lateral and a standard medial approach. It's just a little more difficult to do it in a prone position in the posterior lateral approach. But once you learn it, all these questions go out of the window. Absolutely. I'll add one more thing, sir, Professor Dillon, to it. You see, whenever we are treating these injuries, we need to treat them with a heart, wholeheartedly. Never treat them incompletely. The moment you treat them incompletely, just because you are not aware of the posterior approaches, you are not able to fix by those approaches. I think we are doing an injustice to our patients. Yeah. What I, what Professor Dillon has said is absolutely right. We have to be very cautious because these, whenever the, these rings are broken, unless and until they are stabilized, you'll always land up in a problem. And don't simply rely. I have seen many people putting the compression screws in, from interior side just because they want to avoid the posterior approach. Posterior malleolar need to be stabilized and we should always use the buttress plates. That only is the way to come out of these situations. Yeah. You see, most of the thing is that sometimes we get away with inadequate stabilization. It's like jumping yes. a red light. I yes. can jump a red light once, I get no problem. But if I jump a red light four times, once the truck will hit yes. me from the side, oh, who yes. is coming on the right way. Yes, so sir. just because we've gotten away by doing a few cases with, you know, limited exposures, adding a plaster, everything, doesn't yes. mean it's the right way. Yeah. So you've got to do it the right way every time so that you don't get into trouble. Yes. But that's what this classification is. The, I'm not saying fix all posterior malleolus, the type 1s and the type 3s and the type 5s. You don't have to. But one key small thing is if you're looking at size, look at the size of the fragment and how much of the incisura where the fibula comes into place is involved. If it is less than one third and the whole ring is stable with everything by your fibular plate and your medial malleolus and your transcendmatic maybe you can get away with it but if it is more than one third of the uh, incisura you will never be able to get an accurate reduction of the posterior malleolus it will be slightly higher riding there will be a that there will be a sort of step in the articular surface and this will give rise to problems all over all the guys who question 
fixing the posterior malleolus would put three plates in the proximal tibia. Same guys. Yes. <laughs> or three plates in the pelvis. Same guys. Yes. Why? The issue is, this is not different. It's an articular fracture. I think I just tell them, imagine it to be the proximal tibia upside down. The way you would stabilize the proximal tibia, stabilize the ankle with the posterior malleolus fracture. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, uh, sometimes uh, if we are uh, doing direct reduction of uh, syndesmosis by incising the anterior anterior laterally uh, to to see the incisus era, will it affect more on the instability of uh, uh, syndesmosis? You are not cutting are... anything, boss. You are only cutting the skin and retracting it to see. Once the syndesmosis is disrupted. Those fibers are lying disrupted anyway. You just got to get the interior part of the fibula in the notch. And there was one school of thought in Jokate that we, oh, we've opened it up. Why don't we suture it also? But that doesn't work. And many times you'll get the chaput fragment. Like if you have a chaput fragment, you have to go there anyway. And I've got chaput fragments in which we put small suture anchors also to put it back. Yes. So it all depends. They are all variations of the same theme. The only time when I am not doing to fix anything in the front is when we advocate, when we are not sure of the reduction of the uh, of the syndesmosis. The best way known short of a CT scan was to check the reduction from the front. So any tip uh, to reduce, uh, to control the rotation and length of the comminuted fibula? <laughs> That is a separate talk which I am giving in an AO course next week. Okay, uh, sir. But we can, that's that's on complex malleolar fractures. The moment you have comminution, you have problems. Because not only do you have length discrepancies, you have rotational discrepancy. And these are all pronation external rotation or pronation abduction injuries. When you have pronation abduction injuries, the whole syndesmotic complex is pushed off. Most other injuries involve rotation of the talus which causes a sequential breaking of the syndesmotic complex from the front to the middle to the back. Here, all of them are pushed off. So you have a problem. So it becomes a different. And one tip which I do is when I'm reducing it and I'm looking at it under C arm, I put an X-ray of the opposite foot on the AP view in the front. So you have to get the length of the fibula right. And there are so many things, radiological, Shenton view, etc. But you can't ensure that you've got it 100% right. You can try and bring it back and even if you get 99% right, then you want to check the rotations and by checking the rotations, you need to open the front of the uh, syndesmosis. Uh, uh, Sirohi sir, I have a small 90 second video in which hmm. I am operating a trimalular fracture in prone position. I have just shared that in my WhatsApp. If you allow me, I can do the screen sharing. And just for the benefit of my uh, audience, I can show how to position the patient, how you can actually do it. If you allow me, I can do that. Hmm. Yes, yes. Right, sir. So I'll just try to do that. Um, Well, please continue the discussion as long as, uh, as soon as I'm able to do it, I'll do it. Uh, just a moment. Yes, so there it is. Can you, can you see it? Mm. Yes. I'm sorry. That it cannot be played. Something wrong. Antonu, you can't play videos directly on Zoom platforms. What you need to do is you have to make them you have to make them into clips and add them to a presentation. Otherwise yes. you can't play them directly from your computer. Right. Anyway. right. I'm sorry, so, sir. Uh, so I think that's the end of it all. Yes, I. Thank guess. you, sir. Uh, yes, thank you very much, everybody. Thank what you. I feel is, sir, 
the audience and uh, all the people must have got clear cut messages from dr mandeep dillon and uh, dr anke agrawal such and uh, the take home messages in both the talks of dr dillon were very clear cut thank you sir all of you thanks dr dillon dr anke agrawal sir dr vijayan chauhan dr shantanu dr puneet Thank, thank you very much, sir. Everybody. Thank I, you. I would request Dr. Puneet for a formal vote of thanks from the Uttaranchal Orthopedic Association. Yeah. On behalf of Uttarakhand Orthopedic Association, I would like to thank to Professor Dillon sir and Professor Agrawal sir and Dr. Vijayan Chauhan sir and Dr. Shantanu sir. Ortho thank TV sir. team, Dr. Siroi sir. Thanks to all. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it was a pleasure. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful talk. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Sirohi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Vijayendra, no, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Nice to see you, bye -bye. Nice you after you. a long time. Yeah, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Sirohi. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you, sir. Bye. Bye. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night.